in this part of the training, we're going to look at a manifestation of the principles of cooling that we have been discussing under the section of radiant and structure cooling. This technique is called structure cooling and we're going to try and understand how it can be applied in modern buildings to solve the thermal comfort needs of occupants. All right, why do we want to do structure cooling? We believe that structure cooling is the closest thing we have in the modern era to replicate the system of cooling that used to prevail when electricity had not been invented. So imagine the predicament of a building designer before the invention of electricity hundreds and hundreds of years ago. The only way they could cool a building is to first try and stop the heat as effectively as possible by creating barriers around the building, right? So the first strategy was stopping. They used to use trees, verandas, certain kinds of hollow spaces to prevent the heat from coming in. However, not all of it could be prevented. Whatever you couldn't prevent, you would try to delay. So the first strategy was stop. The second was to try to delay the heat from coming into the occupied space. That would be achieved through thick walls. And if you uh, look back at all kinds of historical buildings in all regions of India, they would have had very thick walls to prevent the heat from coming in. Even residential you know, huts in, in India's villages usually have very thick mud walls. Now, whatever you couldn't delay, the only option you had to still keep yourself cool was to drain the heat out. And very often, these kinds of traditional buildings had some sort of a water body or some way of channeling air into the building to drain the heat that had accumulated. Right. So stopping, delaying and draining were the only three strategies. Can we have these three strategies at work in modern day buildings? Let's ask ourselves that question. We think it's highly unlikely that we would actually ever have the kind of space around our buildings on a routine basis to be able to plant enough trees, have big verandas, have hollow spaces. So the ability to stop heat is actually quite impeded with the modern method of construction. Also, you often have buildings that are much taller than the trees. So how are you going to stop the heat from getting into those buildings? It's going to be difficult. All right, so that throws out one possibility. The second possibility is the possibility of thick walls to delay the heat from coming in. If you uh, ask yourself the question, if you were given a choice of two homes, one with much smaller carpet area compared to the other building or the other house with much more carpet area, even if you had thin walls in the other one, most people would choose the larger home, even though they had much more heat coming into the house because you would think that I can just buy an AC and repel that heat, right? So our desire for maximizing the livable space even precludes the second option, which is delaying the heat as much as possible. So what turns out to be our only way of mimicking that traditional method of cooling in modern day buildings is to try to drain the heat as effectively as possible. Now, this also has challenges because in the past, the draining of the heat happened through water bodies. And as you might have noticed in urban spaces, water bodies A are first of all being greatly constrained in terms of their flow rate, rivers are drying up, streams are drying up, etc. So our buildings can't really use them as a heat sink. But not only that, even if you had a body of water, you would need a continuous supply through the year to allow you to drain heat into it. Can we still work with this principle though of draining heat? But rather than using an unlimited supply of water throughout the year, can we try to contain it in some sort of a loop system to get the benefits of draining but not use very high quantities of water? A modern manifestation of these methods of cooling in current buildings is called structure cooling and we're going to try and understand how these systems work. This is the first step towards understanding the power of these cooling systems compared to conventional air conditioning. So let's try and understand this chart here. This chart is, has been prepared by the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Engineers. So it's actually the air conditioning industry openly telling you something very meaningful which we seem to have forgotten as engineers and designers. All right. So in this chart on the X axis here, you have the dry bulb temperature, which is just the air temperature that a person experiences. On the Y axis on the left, you have this term or this, this parameter, it's the BTUs per hour, which is nothing but a power rating. 
kilowatts is the same thing as BTU per hour. Now what this chart is showing you is that at different temperatures ranging from 50 degrees Fahrenheit to 110 degrees Fahrenheit, what are the methods of cooling that the human body can employ to remain cool spontaneously, which is without the addition of uh, external energy. So if you look at the low body temperatures over here, well, you will never really be in this range, but say you take the 70 to 90 degree range, right? Because the average human temperature is close to about 98 Fahrenheit. That's our core body temperature. So you can consider these ranges as being the low temperatures and these being the high temperatures, right? Okay, so when we are in the low reaches of this, of this chart, you will see that most of the heat in the human body is rejected through, through the process of radiation and convection. That's this curve over here. And only when you get to the higher reaches of this chart does evaporation supersede the impact of radiation and convection. What this is telling us is that if we allow the ambient air temperature or the radiant temperature reach this kind of situation of 100 degrees, which is actually about 40 odd Fahrenheit, 40 degrees centigrade, which is not abnormal for a home or an office that is not being cooled. This is the, the traditional temperature that you will, uh, the uh, common temperature that you will feel actually in these spaces. And you can see that the only way the human body can lose heat in that situation is to perspire profusely. What structure and radiant cooling are trying to do is they are trying to reduce the ambient temperature sufficiently so that your body starts losing most of its heat through radiation and convection and not so much through evaporation, which is what thermal comfort should be all about, reducing the amount of perspiration but yet feeling cool. The goal of all of us as building designers and air conditioning designers should be to keep the mean radiant temperature well below your skin temperature so that radiation can start dominating as a cooling process compared to perspiration. Now, this is a science principle. Let's see how you can actually deploy this using equipment that is locally available that does not require large multinational corporations to be involved in solving our cooling challenges, which we should be able to solve locally. So this is a schematic of a typical structure cooling system. Now let me just explain the parts to you. Here you will see a tank with two pumps, pump one and pump two. And this actually has a, a insulated, insulated barrier between the two sides, right? Okay, we'll get back into that later. The second component is what's called a heat pipe and a fan. So this is a fan, a radiator fan, like you would have in the ceiling, in the exhaust of a kitchen, or even in a car, a car radiator fan. And this is what's called a heat pipe. And this is a slab which is being cooled by pipes that are running through it. Okay, so these are the three main components. A slab that you're trying to cool a pump and a tank and a heat pipe and a radiator. All right. So what does this look like in real life? This is a real life image. This is a rooftop that is being cooled. This one here, as you can see, slab with pipes. This is under the direct influence of the sun. This is in Lower Parel in Mumbai. And there are pipes embedded inside this. And these are plastic pipes. Contrary to what you would expect, very often we have an expectation to keep seeing uh, metal pipes such as copper, etc. being used inside these systems. But if you keep them thin enough, you can actually have a lot of heat transfer going through these pipes, even if they are plastic. All right. So you have plastic pipes that are embedded in here. This is your tank with two chambers. It's about 1000 liters. There is the heat pipe and the radiator. And just to run the whole system using any external energy, without using any external energy, this system here employs a solar photovoltaic panel to run the small pumps that are inside and to run this fan. This, this system also has another innovation applied to it. It is actually a radiator panel where in the night to get even more cooling, the water is just circulated through these radiator panels and it radiates to the night sky, thereby cooling the water even more. But the principle is the same as radiant cooling. And now we're going to try and understand how the water travels through this system and ends up cooling this rooftop under which people are living. The first step of the process is the water starts getting pumped from one chamber inside the tank and makes its way 
through this lab very very slowly the inventor of this uh, technique talks about the uh, this concept of the majestic rate of cooling the goal of the system is not to gush water through these pipes but just to allow it to gently flow like they used to flow in these in the streams that were present in uh, traditional buildings in delhi and agra etc and the goal is to pick up the heat from the slab and say the rooftop is at about 45 degrees 50 degrees under the sun that's often possible and you have water that starts off at somewhere close to 20 to 25 you can imagine that the exiting temperature of the water will be somewhere in between 45 and 25 and you can say 35 would be a a good temperature of the water coming out so that will be warm water exiting the slab now that returning water which is warm is then cooled by the fan in the radiator and this thing called the heat pipe and the heat pipe is something very simple it has a refrigerant enclosed in copper tubes and the refrigerant is dipped into the warm water and through the warmth it is able to evaporate and pick up heat from the warm water and as it rises the fan that is available cools that refrigerant and the cycle continues so without using any electricity any power you are able to cool that water from 35 degrees back down to 25 and it returns to the same tank on the other side right so you started off with water at 25 degrees it got warmed and goes back into the tank ready for the next day's cycle to be repeated if you wanted that 25 degree water to get even cooler what you could do is in the night time you can run that water either through a special radiator panel like we showed you or you could run it through the heat pipe and the radiator again when the night temperatures drop much below say 20 degrees in a city you could actually end up with water that is 20 degrees it's almost chilled water compared to the the ambient air which can be used as a stored amount of cooling for the next day's purposes we now going to show you some pictures to visualize this process one thing that uh, you can tell from here is that this slab is an existing slab it is not a new building it is an old building which is being retrofitted with a structure cooling system and you can see here these are the plastic pipes they they are jointless continuous loops of approximately 100 meters length these are the typical lengths that are involved and they are thin diameter corrugated polypropylene pipe and if you are still not convinced about the ability of of plastic to absorb or lose heat you can think of the fact that when you put a plastic bottle of water in the refrigerator it does get cool over time right yes it does take some time compared to a metal bottle but it eventually does uh, you know conduct the heat away from it now there is possible this is possible with structure cooling because time is not of the essence here as we mentioned the whole goal of this uh, of this design pro of this of this equipment is to allow the water to spend as much time as possible on the rooftop to pick up as much heat as it can right so the goal is not to rush it through it in a very fast uh, with with very high velocity and hence it's okay if the plastic is able to only absorb uh, relatively modest amounts of heat because the time available is high once you've uh, applied the plastic pipes to reuse the rooftop you can cover it back with some sort of a plaster as shown over here so that it can be used for rainwater harvesting again for gardening other kinds of purposes solar thermal this is uh, an image of the kind of tank that is involved this is just the literally the tip of the iceberg because there is a much larger underground tank that the system applies this is just the overhead part of it here is the heat pipe and the radiator and these are the manifolds which is essentially a control system for the for the pipe so what what happens is say if you detect that there is some sort of a problem with one of the loops of 100 meters rather than shutting the whole system down and ripping apart uh, ripping apart all the all the plastic tubing you can isolate any one tubing in which there is a problem in which the pressure has dropped so if you apply simple pressure transmitters you can tell that there has been some amount of water that is being lost there and you can shut that system off automatically and if you have any concerns about water leakage which are often uh, we often encounter these questions about what if the the water leaks so first of all we must keep in mind that we do have systems in buildings where water is embedded in the walls right plumbing for instance carries high pressure water all across the the length and breadth of buildings 
and they are uh, they in fact are metal pipes which can corrode these ones are not metal they won't corrode and there are joints in those in those pipes whereas this one these are jointless pipes and the velocity and pressure is much higher on those compared to this so the chances of leakage if they are accepted in the case of of plumbing are infinitely much lower than uh, than that in the case of these plastic tubings that are used in in structure cooling and also there's a possibility of immediately isolating and shutting down the leakage if a pressure loss is detected in any of these pipes. This is uh, a picture again of the same system that we, we showed you. Now let's look at the, the benefits of this technology in terms of the measured temperature drops that can be achieved. All right, so this is a before picture. I'll show you the after picture in a second. Now, what is this? This is a automatic data logger it was a device that was installed on a rooftop in Mumbai as, as an experiment and it charted the temperatures on the top of the slab and the bottom of the slab throughout the day. And the blue line here or the blue dots here indicate the temperature at the top of the slab. And as you can see in this case at about 2.30 in the afternoon peak um, uh, solar exposure you have approximately 42 degrees outside on, the roof, on, the, on top of the roof. And this is the slab bottom temperature. And as you can see, there is some delay effect in the sense that because of the thickness of the concrete, you are seeing that even though outside it's 42, it takes a while for the temperature at the bottom of the slab to rise. However, at some point, its capacity is, is breached. It cannot store the heat anymore and it allows the heat to start coming into the room. And as you will see, the temperature at the bottom of the rooftop slab reaches close to your skin temperature at 35 degrees somewhere late evening around 8 o'clock or so. Which means that if you enter the room somewhere after 7.50, the moment you enter that room, actually much earlier at even about 6 o'clock, the moment you enter the room, you will start perspiring because as that ash ray chart showed earlier, at those temperatures, your body's only option for losing heat spontaneously is through perspiration. Hence, the person will reach out for as the inventor of this technology says, reach out for either one of two things, either the doorknob to open the door and leave or for a remote control to turn on the air conditioner. Now, this is the situation that we need to try and prevent. If we can bring this entire pink line, the slab bottom temperature to a level that is comfortable and below the skin temperature, not only do you prevent perspiration, but you are also allowing the body to become an agent of its own cooling. And let's see if this is possible by turning on the structure cooling system. So this is the before picture and now look at the after picture. This is the after picture over here. The key thing to keep in mind and to focus on is this yellow line. As you can see, this is 30 degrees centigrade. By turning the structure cooling system on, on a similar kind of day in the same city, you are able to achieve slab bottom temperatures that do not exceed 30 degrees. And at any given time of the day, no matter what the outside temperature is, your body will feel relatively cool and you'll be able to radiate a lot of your heat to this system. Right? Uh, we look at how this solves part of the problem, not the whole problem, because there is also humidity that causes discomfort. And we look at how this system can be used along with conventional systems so that you do part of the cooling through this very efficient system and let just the fractional part that is required for making you feel drier that can be done with an air conditioner and even in this hybrid format these technologies are shown to save a lot of energy and reduce climate change quite significantly looking at some more data about the benefits of these houses of these systems here are four projects which have applied structure cooling this is a place in in uh, jaipur this is the pilot project in Mumbai. This is another rooftop in Mumbai at, on top of a, uh, an auditorium called the Veer Savakar Smarak. And this is an office in Nasik, an information technology office in Nasik. And as you can see, in all these cases, the rooftop temperatures are quite high. This is the key parameter. Without the structure cooling system, you are getting about 45 degrees in this case. So somewhere between, in this case, 30. This is Mumbai, so of course, as expected but you can get 45 degrees as the roof bottom temperature, which is insufferable. A person entering the space would immediately start, you know, breaking into uh, a huge sweat. Look at the benefit of having structure cooling installed. 
in all of these cases. In this case, Cabra House, the temperature drops down from 45 down to 29. In the case of Mumbai, this was a mild summer day, so the impact is quite less, but it's still about 1 or 2 degrees. In the case of this other project in Mumbai, it was about 12 degrees. In the case of this building in Nasik, it was about 8 or 9 degrees. So structure cooling is working in reducing the mean radiant temperature from insufferable values to much more comfortable values. And this can also be enhanced by adding a little more artificial cooling in the water. So even if you do want to use a chiller to reduce the temperature of the water, you'd be using it in, a, in as efficient a manner and as responsible a manner as possible to bring this temperature down just a little bit more to enhance the radiant or structure cooling effect. These are saving percentages uh, from another site uh, where these things were measured. And you can see in this case, the savings are approximately 24 to 27% in terms of energy and the temperature being reduced. This technology, uh, there's a hidden versatility in this. If you uh, think of the fact that there are some places in India which not only need cooling, but also need heating at some times of the year. And what this slide is trying to show you is that the system can be used for heating as well as cooling. And the way to do this would be very simple. If you had a solar thermal heating system or even some system that uses waste heat, right? that heat can be channeled through the same pipe network. So you would shut the radiator off so you don't do any more cooling because the challenge is to reduce the amount of cooling. And you would just channel warm water in the same pipes and the, the effect would be, be replaced by a radiant heating effect where the, where the surfaces would heat you up very effectively and you wouldn't need to heat the air. Right? Um, so this is one of the most significant advantages of this technology for buildings in the composite or even the temperate zone where sometimes you have heating and sometimes you have cooling needs. Now I'm going to show you a set of installation pictures. This is the rooftop, the a retrofit rooftop of the Veer Sarvakar Smarak in Mumbai. It was about six and a half thousand square feet of space and you can see these plastic tubings being laid and then being covered part by part by the concrete screed to recreate the rooftop surface. This is an example of a museum in, uh, uh, that has been cooled through structure cooling. Now, the reason why we've included this image is that most people think that these systems can only be used for flat surfaces. And of course, that's easy enough. How do you deal with complex shapes? So this is an example of a sloping surface where again, pipes have been laid. And in this case, to enhance the cooling effect, they have used a small chiller in both those floors here. Uh, this is also being uh, done in a multi-story building actually. This museum is a multi-story building. And through using the chillers, they're able to drop the temperature, the water temperature down below 20 degrees as well. Right? So you can almost recreate a air conditioning effect uh, in terms of even the, the, the low temperatures that are possible. These are some more pictures of uh, installation of this technology on the rooftop of a building in Gujarat. This is an example of an installation in the intermediate floors of a building. Now, while it's true that solar heat affects the building predominantly through the rooftop, because that's the part that has direct exposure, the, the angle of exposure of the walls, etc., is much lower. So the amount of heat coming in from the walls is not as much as, as rooftop, unless, of course, it's a high rise. So for high rise buildings, where there's adequate amount of heat coming directly to the floors, through the big windows, etc., there you can put structure cooling pipes in every floor. And another property about heat that we have to remember, with, especially with solar heat, it's almost like water in terms of how it pervades through a structure. So the moment heat comes in from either the sun or from some external source, eventually it will make its way into any part of the structure which is thermally connected to it. And in this case, all the floor slabs of the building. So while the effectiveness will be lower, for any intermediate slab, it still does do the job of draining the heat from the building. This is an example of a, of a uh, design center in Gujarat, in Kutch, where structure cooling is being applied all over the place. This is a picture of the rooftop. And this is the image of a building that is being structure cooled from the inside. It's quite stark, uh, uh, an image, I think, because there is no presence of any air conditioning devices, as you can see. It's, very clean and aesthetically pleasing surfaces. There are no ducts over here. 
that are occupying space. It gives a, a sense of spaciousness to this place. And as you can imagine, that this place would have very little vibration sounds, sounds of air gushing through the place because this place is being cooled in such a gentle manner where you have the ceiling and maybe the floor being cooled through this structure cooling system and it gently allows the people to radiate heat to it. There is no uh, air being used and what this also does is that there is a small gentle convection current that is set up when you use these systems. As the cool air from the ceiling gently falls down, it replaces the warm air which then rises, gets cooled, so on and so forth. And this sets up a very gentle and pleasing convection current. What are the benefits of this technology compared to conventional air conditioning systems? The first is that you are able to do away with this idea of pumping heat using a lot of environmental resources and rather than that using a natural system such as the gravitational flow of heat spontaneously out of the building. You can use a limited amount of water without having streams of water running through the building continuously using say like a river supply or a stream supply. Here a closed circuit of water does the job for you. The amount of power used is very low because all you're doing is using a pump and a fan and even that can be put on solar power. And this perhaps is also uh, a very powerful benefit of this technology compared to the highly engineered and exotic cooling systems that we have all gotten used to. This one uses all locally made components and uses technology which is out there in the public domain. There are no prohibitive patents which, which elevate the, the cost of these technologies. And also these can be used in retrofit mode in almost all situations. In, uh, in commercial and residential buildings in India. Let's look at the numerical benefits of this technology in terms of the energy save, the cost reduction, as well as the climate change impacts of this technology. Here is uh, a comparison of a conventional cooling system and a hybrid cooling system, which is a structure cooling system with some amount of air conditioning to address the humidity needs of this building. So the sensible cooling is happening through structure cooling and the latent cooling is happening through an air conditioning system. Now what that does is that the conventional COP of a system is typically around 2.93. That's often seen in chillers. With a hybrid system, the key difference is that, that the 2.93 system uh, or the COP of 2.93 becomes 4.53 because a, a large part of the cooling is happening very efficiently and a small part is happening very uh, inefficiently, right? So this is the eventual benefit. The power requirement comes down from, in this case, for cooling of a thousand square foot space. The power would have been about 7.8 kilowatts for a conventional system. It comes down to about five, right? And what happens is that the capital cost does increase to some degree because here you have civil work. You need to embed the pipes. You need to cover it back up, etc. However, the slight increase in terms of capital cost. So for 1000 square foot space, like a typical two bedroom apartment, say for example, the capital cost would be approximately 60,000 rupees more. But because the power is reduced so significantly for especially homes that plan to use the air conditioning for two, 3000 hours a year, the payback period would be very, very attractive. This also has tremendous carbon and energy uh, efficiency benefits. As you can see, the power is dropping by at least a factor of about 30%. So there's a directly a 30% to 40% reduction in energy consumption as well as the global warming impacts of this technology. If you have further questions, please do not hesitate to get in touch with us uh, on our email addresses or through our portal fairconditioning.org. Thank you.